All right, Matthew chapter 19, Matthew chapter 19. Last week, I went an hour and 41 minutes, I realized when I was editing. So I'm going to try to go a little um, less time this time. And I guess you call this clickbait, right? I, I entitled this Marriage, Divorce, and Dispensation. So maybe people will look at that and go, ooh, cool, and they'll click on it. We'll see. But what we're going to do today is go verse by verse through Matthew chapter 19. And I truly believe that verse by verse Bible study is the best way to study the Bible because it allows God to speak to us in context, not just getting up here and me giving my opinion. Amen. It's what the Bible says. Now, what the Bible says here might make some people mad today. And that's not my intent. Um, my intent is just to show you what it says. But I also want you to remember that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sins. OK, so maybe some of you have been through what we're going to read today. And maybe some of you have sinned. Maybe someone else has sinned against you. <laughs> I don't know how that works. Just remember that it's under the blood if you're saved. And, but also remember, let's try to do this thing the right way for our children's sake. And so some people get angry when you talk about divorce. <laughs> and I don't want to come across as I'm attacking anyone because I'm not. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. But I also want our children to get married and not get divorced. OK, are we all agreement there? Yeah. So divorce is a horrible thing. It can hurt a lot of people. Yes, it does happen, but it's not something that we want to happen. So I'm not you got to protect yourself nowadays. You know, I'm not talking to anyone in particular in here because honestly, I don't know what a lot of you've been through. And I don't want to know, to be honest with you. <laughs> when people tell me stuff, it goes in here and out here because I don't want to remember things that that I shouldn't know. You know what I mean? But I do believe the Bible says it. We need to look at it. OK. And if we follow the Bible, our life will be so much better. Now, if you could go back in a time machine, do you think you might have changed some things? Too bad we can't do that, right? But what we can do is we can try to teach the younger generation, hey, there's the mistakes we made. Let's don't make those in your life. My dad always told me, he said, son, don't make mistakes. I'm like, dad, that's impossible. But he kept saying, he was adamant, don't make mistakes. I said, well, how? finally, I said, how do I not make? He said, you learn from others and don't make the same mistakes they do. That has helped me a lot. So I look at the mistakes of others. And I say, well, I'm not going to do what they did. All right, now let's get started. Like I said, I don't want to go too long today, but here we go. The outline of Matthew chapter 19 is marriage and divorce. Jesus talks about what marriage is and he talks about what divorce is. Verse 13 through 15, let the kids come to Jesus. Again, we need to train up our children the right way and we need those kids to do it the right way. My grandmother had three children and every one of them was divorced. My, my grandmother felt like a complete failure because she said when she grew up, the word divorce was like a four letter word. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think she told me this story where my dad said divorce one time and he's a kid and she washed his mouth out with soap. That's the generation she grew up in, that divorce was a bad word. Now we have easy divorces everywhere. Oh, yeah. But we as Christians, we need to teach our children that marriage is for life. And there's a reason that God wants you to get married for life. And I can't wait to get into that because it's a type of something. And that's fun to get into. Now we're going to look at the rich young ruler and riches. And how we shouldn't trust in riches. My dad used to say it like this. God showed what he thought about money by the kind of people he gave it to. <laughs> Uh-oh, if you're rich, I'm not offending you. You can donate anytime. No, I'm just kidding. But any, uh, anyway, um, sometimes we trust in our money more than we trust in God. That's not a problem for a lot of us here, right? Because we're all dirt poor. <laughs> Amen. But um, be careful. Be careful. And when we get into this, we're going to see that you cannot teach this for today. This definitely ties into dispensations. OK. And then the last thing is the future of the apostles and others. Where are they going to be in the kingdom? The Bible tells us. So let's get into this. I put a map here, too. And I've got some stuff on the back of the board also. So let's get into this. Matthew chapter 19. And it says, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. So Jesus is in Galilee. Now we've seen, here's the map, and I'm sorry it's so small, but up here is the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus was born, in, or, or not born, but he was from Nazareth. So he was raised in Nazareth. 
Okay, he was actually born in Bethlehem down here, close to Jerusalem. So Jesus is spending a lot of his life around the Sea of Galilee. Remember Bethsaida, and then there was another city up here. I'm drawing a blank on the name, but he's in a lot of these places. And so it says that Jesus decided to come down. Now, Jesus, all of his life, they say he never went more than 100 miles away from any given point. And in those days, they walked everywhere. That's why they were so skinny. <laughs> but Jesus would come down to Jerusalem and go back and come to Jerusalem and go back. And he would go back and forth a lot. And so here he is up here with the people around that area. And it says, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. Now the coast, that has to do with the border of Judea. So here's Judea, right? So he's coming down and he's somewhere around here, around the border of Judea. So he's somewhere over, and then it's on this side. So he's somewhere right over here. Now, if I remember right, this is the River Jordan. That was kind of where John the Baptist started his ministry. So Jesus is coming down there. And here's what happens. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. So those multitudes are coming from all over, and they're going to the Jordan River, this beautiful, beautiful, clear river. And Jesus is healing people. So it sounds like everyone's having a great time. People are going there and people are getting healed. Wonderful. And then all of a sudden, what's the next thing that happened? Pharisees. Here come the Pharisees to try to mess it all up. Isn't that funny? As soon as something goes good, the devil has to mess it up. I recently got a phone call from a friend about a, a great church that we know of. And now that church, when we went and visited there, we almost couldn't get a seat. It was so full. Now that church is almost, well... I'm not going to say almost empty, but it's split. Seems like when things are going good and the best, that's when, uh-oh, here comes the devil to send something in to mess things up. So it says, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Notice what they're doing. They're tempting him, and they're tempting him with a question of the law. Now, I think what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and read Verse 3 all the way down to verse 9. Then we'll go back so we can get the context. But look at this again. Verse 2. Great multitudes followed him and he healed them there. What does that show us by Jesus healing people? I believe that shows us his divinity. He is God manifest in the flesh. And they come to tempt God. Who else tempted God? Satan. Satan. <laughs> so who is in the Pharisees? And what were the Pharisees? They were the pastors of their day. Do we have in America pastors led by Satan? I think we do. We have some good pastors, thank God. But a lot of pastors in America have gone the way of false translations that aren't the true Bible, false gospel, and a false way of living. And a lot of them have turned toward politics uh, and toward things like that. And they're talking about everything but the only thing that matters, salvation. And so it says, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder." That's don't get divorced, God says. They say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. So if you divorce your wife, the Bible says that's a hard hearted thing to do. Unless, you know, perhaps she cheated on you or something. Like that. But still, it, you're supposed to be together and not have a hard heart. Marriage is supposed to be trusting one another. So that's kind of sad that they had a hard... And Jesus said Moses allowed that. What we're reading here, it sounds like God says, no, he didn't want that. And so it says, And he saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. So God never intended divorce in his plan for man. Isn't that interesting? And it says here in verse 9, And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. So Jesus is telling them, this is the way I wanted it, as God, who created man and women, 
that you get married and you never get divorced. Now, if someone goes and commits adultery, then you can get remarried. But do you think God wanted them to do that either? No, that's something God says not to do. Matter of fact, in the Old Testament, under the law, if you did that, you were to be stoned to death. I think God's a little dogmatic on this subject, isn't he? Yet we live in a world of easy divorcism where, well, let's just get together and see how it goes. If it doesn't work out, we'll get divorced. That's the mentality of people. That's not God's mentality. God's mentality is you get married, you stay together for life. That's what God wants. So there's a lot of stuff here going on. So lots to look at. First of all, look at verse 3, and this is the question. The Pharisees tempt Jesus with the question, is divorce okay? That's an interesting question. But actually, it's, it's more than that. The question is, is the divorce lawful? So they were all about the law. Are there laws in America? And the laws in America say you can get a divorce. So the question is, do we follow God or do we follow man-made law? Which one do you follow? Yeah. I've met a lot of Christians in my life, and I'll just say it. They divorced their spouses because they knew they could because the law of the land said so, and they did it because they didn't like that other person. There was no adultery there. They just, I don't like you anymore. How does God feel about that if God told you as a Christian, don't do that? And yet they claim to be Christians. I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> so, um, boy, I hope I'm not offending anybody. But you know, I want you to see what the Bible says. God wants you to be together for life. Why? For the children. I came from a divorced family. My mother and father were divorced. Four years I couldn't see my father. And it hurts. It hurts to not have both parents together. So I think God knows best, don't you? And I think he knows why he said that. So when you get into marriage, that's what you need to get into and realize this is something for life. Till death do us part is the vow. And it's not, well, if I don't like you, I'm just going to leave you. That's not how God set this thing up. So what are they saying when they said, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? All right. See, there, there's more than just one question there. It's not, is divorce OK? And it's not just, is divorce OK according to the law? The question is, is divorce OK according to the law for any cause? So they're going to Jesus and they're going, so you think it's OK just to divorce anybody for any reason you want to? That's what they're doing. And Jesus says, well, you want to bring the law into this. What does the law say? Well, let's look at what the law says. Let's go to Deuteronomy. And again, who wrote this into the law? Moses. So Jesus is saying, yeah, I let Moses write this in there. I didn't tell him to. What a odd thing, isn't it? Well, God allowed it. God allowed it. But there's a reason for this. And I think the more I've read this, the more I think it all has to do with adultery. It's not just, well, if you just don't like her, then you can divorce her. I think the thing that it's saying is if you marry her and she goes out with another guy and, and has relations with him, that's when. I think that's what it's saying. It's kind of read between the lines thing. But go to Deuteronomy 24, verse 1 through 4, and this is what the reference is referring to where Jesus is talking about. And this is what Moses wrote with his own hand. And Moses wrote this into the law. This is not what God wanted, but he allowed Moses to write this in there. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement. So what is that uncleanness? She stinks, and now he has a right to divorce her. <laughs> he, he marries her, and she's got a big hairy mole. Oh, I don't like her anymore. I think what it's talking about is the uncleanness is the fact that she went out with somebody else and did something she shouldn't have done. That's my thought on that. And it says, Summon cleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. Now, what is divorce? In America, we think divorce is the piece of paper because we've been indoctrinated to think that marriage is the piece of paper. And it's not. Marriage is a vow. And we're going to look at marriage here in a minute. But it sounds like she divorced him. Now he's giving her a paper and saying, look what you did to me. That's what a writing of divorcement is. Okay, And I want you to see that because I'm going to get into this here in a minute. I went to a Bible school where they taught us a certain way about this, and I think they were wrong. 
And I've seen many people use that as an excuse to divorce somebody else. And that hurts me because that's not what God intended. God hates divorce because it breaks a type. I can't wait to teach you that type too. So it says, um, Then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. So she commits adultery with another man. He gives her right. Now she's probably going to go shack up with that other guy is what it sounds like. And if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and giveth it in her hand and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife after that she is defiled. For that is abomination before the Lord. So there's no um, swapping wives, <laughs> no wife swapping in the Bible. I mean, that sounds funny, but that's what it's saying. So this guy marries this girl and she's like, well, I never loved you. I left him instead. And she's going out in the evening and spending time with him and sleepovers. And but more than just a sleepover doing bad stuff. Guess what? He can go and say, well, I'm, I don't want you anymore. You adulterated on me. And she runs and marries that guy. And then that guy dies and she comes back. God says, no, you can't take her back because she made her choice. So isn't that something? Now, have you ever heard of stories like this? I mean, there's so many things happening in the world today. Uh, most people's life is like a soap opera in, in America. I mean, you watch soap operas and you're like, that's silly. I've seen even worse than that, you know, and they always write things that are crazy. But in real life, real life is nuts. So we look at this. And so this is them having a bill of divorcement. All right. So the question they ask is, is it lawful to get divorced for any reason? And the answer is no. There's only one reason to get divorced. The answer is the law may allow it, but God doesn't want it. God never wants a divorce. If your wife does that to you, you made a vow for life. You should take her back. That's really hard to do, though, if you can't trust her. That's why before you get married, make sure you meet the right person that you can trust. So you never have to worry about that. A lot of people get married too soon, too fast to the wrong person. Well, guess what? Now you're stuck. <laughs> they're, they're like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> not you guys. No, but you you've seen it. And that's why they get divorced. Well, no, you should make sure in my mind, marriage is for life. No matter what, if I have to stay with this person, I'm going to do it for life and never get divorced. OK, now maybe we'll sleep in separate beds. <laughs> maybe we'll sleep in separate houses, <laughs> but we'll never get divorced. OK, you heard the story about the guy that that was married to this woman and he, he couldn't stand her. So he'd sleep with a, a gun under his pillow and she'd sleep with a knife under hers. Right. And so that way they were always in case one of them, you know, and every every time they wake up, what, what, what? And they grab under the pillow, you know. No. So marriage is forever. Divorce, no. Murder, yes. No, no, I'm joking. That was a joke. That was a joke. <laughs> Only a joke, okay? But, um, so, but that's what marriage is supposed to be, till death do us part. You made a vow to God to say, till death do us part. So in the Old Testament, Moses allowed a writing of divorcement. And guess who that was allowed to? To the man only. It didn't say to the woman, did it? Isn't that interesting? Who usually gets the divorce? A lot of times it's a woman divorcing her husband. And a lot of times it's to get whatever he has. <laughs> so there's a lot of women out there. There's a name for a woman like that. I don't remember what that is, but someone that marries a man just to get what he has. Is that, is that a coyote or something? Am I thinking of the wrong word? I know there's a word, but I can't think of it. Gold digger. Is there another word? But there's women out there certainly like that, that, um, oh yeah, there was some movie and it was the name of the movie or something I'm thinking of where these ladies just marry rich guys and take what they have. I forget. But gold digger is another one or something. Um, anyway, I can't think of the word, which is good. So anyway, God never wants divorce. Now, when I say that, sure as the world, someone that knows their Bible will stand up and what will they say? You're wrong, Robert Breaker. God divorced so-and-so. Let's go to Malachi chapter 2 and let me show you what it says. Malachi chapter 2 and the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, God the Father said to Israel that they're his wife. Okay? So the bride of Christ is the bride of Jesus. Israel is the bride of the Father. They're not the same. Okay? That's very important that we understand that. Malachi chapter 2 and verse 16 Look at what it says. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. 
and then it goes on there. So God hates divorce. That's what he says. God hates putting away. But look at Isaiah chapter 50 in verse 1. This is where they say, yeah, but, but God divorced Israel. Hold on a second. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 1 and let's see if you're right. Because a lot of people say, well, if God can get divorced, I can too. And they divorce their spouse. What is that? Hardness of heart, right? Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, where is the bill of your mother's divorcement who I have put away? So God put somebody away. Yet he says he hates putting away. So did God divorce Israel? Well, some people say yes. But remember, the bill of divorcement is what you give someone when they committed adultery on you. Did Israel commit adultery on, on the father? Yes. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 8. So I do not see God divorcing Israel. What I see is Israel divorcing God through adultery and God going, okay, here's your writing of divorcement. Here's what you did to me since you don't want me anymore. Here's the papers. Right? So that's the way I see it. But I have seen people literally go to the Bible and say, well, if God can divorce, I can too. And that's somebody that doesn't read the Bible. And that makes me so sad because you made that vow till death do us part. And now you're just looking for an excuse to try to undo your vow. But, well, let's turn back to, um, well, let's read Jeremiah 3, 8 first. Then we're going to turn to Ecclesiastes. Jeremiah 3, 8. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. So, she committed adultery. She divorced him. Go to uh, Ecclesiastes. So do you see God is not in favor of divorce? And God has never divorced Israel. In fact, if you read Ezekiel, he said he'll take her back. So that's interesting. He was willing to take her back, even though he shouldn't. Even though the law said you shouldn't, God still had grace that he was willing to. Wow. So that shows you God has no hard heart. What did I say to go to? Ecclesiastes. So that's after... Um, Song of Solomon, if I remember right. Proverbs, excuse me, after Proverbs. And Ecclesiastes 5, 4, right, Laura? Okay, so what is marriage? What is marriage? When you get married, you're married by the vow that you make to God and each other. And that vow is binding. And what is that vow? Till death do us part. So you make a vow to that person, I'm never going to leave you. I'm going to be with you until one of us dies. What is divorce? Breaking your vow. What is your vow? Your word. A person is only as good as their word. If they break their word, what have they done? So look at what it says in um, Ecclesiastes chapter 5. And I think I want not just verse 4, I think 5 and 6 as well. So Ecclesiastes 5, 4. When thou vowest a vow unto God, all right, why do we get married in the church? Because we're making a vow before the Lord and to each other. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Is God calling you a fool if you get divorced? That's what it sounds like. It's a very foolish thing to get divorced. And it says, Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay it. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? So why aren't pastors preaching that marriage is for life and not to get divorced? I've heard of pastors counseling people to get divorced. That makes me so sad. That makes me livid, if you will. That is not a Bible believer. Now, my old pastor said it this way, and this is where he was wrong. He said there are three reasons for a divorce. And when he called it reasons for a divorce, that always bothered me. Because I saw people in that church say, yeah, well, he said I had a, a, a reason to get divorced, so I divorced so-and-so. I don't believe in reasons for a divorce. I believe in causes of a divorce. What is it? Because I don't believe you have any reason to get divorced. God said he doesn't want that. Right. Even if they do go commit adultery on you, you still made that vow. They might have not followed their vow. Maybe you might be a fool, but you don't have to be. You see what I'm saying? You can stay with that person. But the causes of divorce. If someone dies, are you divorced? Yes, well, yeah, 
Because a divorce is a, a separating, a way of, of cutting asunder the two that are together. So if a person dies, that's a divorce. It sounds funny, doesn't it? But you said, till death do us part. Well, the death broke that vow or that bind. So death is divorce. So if you're married and your husband or, or wife dies, you've been divorced. <laughs> and people say, you can't be a pastor and be divorced. Well, my three wives I had in my lifetime, each one died. Can I get remarried? I mean, they never talk about that. They always think only this one is the divorce. Well, this guy, my old pastor, taught that desertion is divorce. If they run off and leave you, are you divorced? I don't think so. So that one doesn't work. And let me show you that in the Bible. Um, in the Bible, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you are separated, you're just separated. A separation is not a divorce. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we read these words. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Boy, I'm, I don't want to go long today, but I can't wait to get this out there. Um, this is good information for a lot of people to know. And we need to teach our children marriage is for life. No divorce. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 and 11. And unto the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. So don't separate. Stay together. You made a vow for life. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. So if a man and wife are having problems and they separate, She's never supposed to get remarried or vice versa. What are they supposed to do? Remain unmarried for the rest of their life till they get back together. Is that what happens? Most of the time, no. One of them says, I can't take it anymore. And they go commit what? Adultery. That's what caused the divorce. And then the other one gets the papers and serves them. You divorced me. So it's not, see, in, in the mind of many people, they think getting married is signing a piece of paper. So the paper married you. No, it's your vow you made to God. And so in their mind, they think the paper is the divorce. No, it's the act of what God joined together, let not man put asunder. All right? So, that, so do you see how that is what causes the divorce? So I say two causes of divorce, death and adultery. Desertion shouldn't ever happen. Maybe it needs to. If the two aren't getting along, maybe they should separate for a small time, but they should always come back together. If they're not together, what happens? Somebody gets to where they want somebody else and they mess up. What does the Bible say about that? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. What does it say in verse 5? Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent. So you can read in between there about a husband and a wife. And when you're married, that body of the other person belongs to you and vice versa. That's what the Bible says. A lot of people don't like that, but that has to do with sexual things, and I won't get into that. But when you're married, you're supposed to stay together for life. I don't see any reason for a person to get divorced. But many people go, well, if they commit adultery on me, then I could go get a divorce. No, they've already done the divorce. You might say, now I can get papers. But even that, to me, is kind of like a little hardness of heart. They did me wrong. Now I'm just going to cut them off for the rest of my life. Does God in heaven go, you sinned against me. I'm going to cut you off. Or does God in heaven have a little bit of grace and love? Now, I'm not condoning that sin. Are you ready? But what is marriage? Let's go to um, Ephesians chapter 5. This is where it's all going to come together in your mind. This is why God hates divorce. Okay? Because marriage is a type of our salvation. And divorce would be a type of losing your salvation. Can we lose salvation today? No, not according to Paul. So Ephesians chapter 5, starting verse 21, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. 
Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. And he continues there saying what he said in Matthew chapter 19. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So Christ is a type of the husband, right? And in the marriage relationship, well, it'd be nice if I could spell it right, husband, the, the man is a type of Christ. The woman or the bride, I should have put wife, I'll put wife here. The wife is the type of the church. If the wife can divorce herself from the husband, and this is a type of salvation, then we could lose our salvation. Is that what the Bible teaches? No. The Bible says that when you're saved, you have everlasting life. Everlasting means forever and unchangeable. Jesus Christ said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Right? So how could we? Now, we can go do bad things. We shouldn't. But that doesn't mean we lose our salvation. So when someone let's say a woman divorces her husband, what has she done? She's broken the type of Christ in the church. It's almost like she's saying, yeah, I think you can lose your salvation. <laughs> That's kind of scary. So do you see why it's so important that we as Bible believers try to do it the way God says? Because in type, it's almost like you're saying, no, no, I don't believe in eternal security. It's okay to go do other things. It's okay to get divorced. This is why God hates divorce, because it's a type of him in the church. And he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So there it is. Okay. <laughs> is that good? Now let's go. go back to Matthew chapter 19. If only preachers would see this, because there's many preachers out there claim to be pastors. They've been married more than once. They're fools. I, I don't want to say that, but they're fools because they made a vow and they didn't keep it. If they lied to God and that person, why would I believe anything they said? Now, if their wife ran off and left them with another man and then sent them divorce papers, what, what choice does he have? And the Bible talks about that. If she wasn't saved, if an unbeliever depart, let her depart or let him depart. Man's not under bondage in such cases. And that has happened to some people. They, maybe they, before they got saved, they got married to someone that was evil and that person ran off. Thank God the blood of Jesus Christ takes care of that. Amen. And that they can remarry because the lost person ran off. Right. But the best thing is to understand marriage and come into it as I'm going to keep my vow until I die. If I marry somebody and she turns into a Jezebel, I'm still going to stick with her till the day I die. So maybe it's best not to get married for some people. huh? Let, well, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Look at Paul, <laughs> the Paul the Apostle. Oh boy, Paul was a, was a guy that never got married. Verse, um, uh, let's see. Verse uh, 7, 1 Corinthians 7, 7. For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. So the Apostle Paul never got married. Now some people say, no, he was married. Okay, m maybe he did get married and his wife died and he didn't get remarried. But I think he was a type of Old Testament prophet who never got married named Jeremiah. So I think Paul never got married and he devoted his life to the Lord. And he said, hey man, and what does the Bible say? They that are married careth about the things of the world, how they may please their, their wives. They that are unmarried careth of the things for the Lord, how they may please. So it's easier to serve the Lord when you're not married, according to Paul. Except it's not that easy if you're a man because you're trying to serve the Lord and there's a lot of pretty girls out there, right? So it's, it's one of those things where you need to get married if you're, uh, the Bible says, burning. Yeah. It's, so get married and be thankful and be happy. But marriage is so important in the Bible. So with that stated, let's go back to Matthew chapter 19. Do you understand what marriage is in the mind of God? It's a type of him in the church. And so in God's mind, hey, when I save you, you're with me forever. 
I'm not going to say, oh, well, okay, go to hell <laughs> to somebody that he saved. So that should be our mentality, too. Hey, I want to be a good type of Christ in the church. I want to be a type of Christ to my bride. And she should be, I want to be, uh, um, you know, loving and, and reverence him like I reverence the Lord. That's how it's supposed to work. I hope now that you can teach others that as well and that they will go and tell others. Because America was a great country when people believed this because it was moral. And when people get divorced, a lot of times that destroys society because that leads to more immorality. And what is it the main thing that causes the divorce? This right here. So that is immoral when you do that. So society is destroyed when we see that. It's like that old joke, right? Where this guy, <laughs> this guy, <laughs> it's, a, it's funny, okay? This guy, he's, he, um, he was married once before, been divorced a couple of times, and got together with this woman who was married and divorced a couple of times, and he comes up to her and he goes, your kids and my kids are fighting our kids. <laughs> See how awful that is? But that's, that's an old joke. But it's just, um, it's so sad, though, to see when society is moral and we have something to look up to, it's better. And you're honest because, hey, I made a vow. I'd rather die than break my vow. That's how our forefathers used to be. Now people, I don't like you anymore. I'm just going to go down to the lawyer and pay $69 for a divorce. Have you seen those? Maybe it's probably more now with inflation or whatever. But it's just so sad to see that people... Your word doesn't mean anything anymore. And it used to be your, your word is your bond. Okay? Now, with all that stated, I hope there's no angry people in here. Again, let me remind you that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sins. Maybe you did that to someone. Well, thank God it's under the blood. Don't go back there. Amen? And then don't make that mistake again. Okay? Do you want to say something, honey? Well, while you're still on that and, and you're talking about types, I, I just... I love types in the Bible, and, and I think I think it's pretty evident that God loves types, too. In, in the, it reminds me of the Old Testament where Moses broke a type, and God didn't let him into the promise. Right. I mean, God wanted to show that type so bad yep. that he... Moses messed he it up. what he did, that he didn't let him into the promised land. Amen. And that's Old Testament. And New Testament. And I'm glad you brought that up because we're about to see something, too, that I can't wait to show you that also ties in with this type as we get into the rest of the Matthew 19, that you, you can't lose your salvation here. But could you back here? Hmm, OK, we're going we're gonna to get into that because it was totally different over here. See, now it's grace. But back there it was works. Hmm. So when God, the father, married Israel, he said, you guys, you backslid on me. You're an adult. Over here, it's, it's the son who gets married, Jesus. And we're married forever. We can't lose it. Now, that's not an excuse to go sin, right? No, no excuses. But yeah, that's good. All right. So back to Matthew chapter 19. And it says in verse 3, they asked the question, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? So when Jesus answers, his answer is no. The only cause that a man can give a bill of divorcement is if she commits adultery. But that was Moses for the hardness of your heart. If Jesus can put up with our sins and not divorce us, then if our wife does something, we should put up with that. But we shouldn't want her to. You want to marry the wife that's not going to run off on you. Okay. If you're wanting to marry this woman and every time you go, she's like this, looking at every other guy. It's time to look for another woman that you want to marry. You know what I'm saying? Because you're going to have problems and finding the right wife is important. And I get so many emails from young men saying I can't find one because there's not any. You know whose fault that is? The parents and the pastors not teaching what a woman should be. So anyway, continuing here. So we read verse three all the way down to verse nine. I don't want to read it again. We'll skip down to verse 10. And it says, His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. <laughs> so they're saying, man, maybe it's better not to get married. Well, that's what Paul did. Paul never got married. But yeah, God wants us to be happy. He that delight, let's see, how does the verse go? He that findeth the wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor with the Lord. So God wants us to be happy in this life. All right. But he said unto them, all men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. 
And then Jesus begins to talk about eunuchs in verse 12. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. And there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Now what on earth is that talking about? Now I'll admit when I first got saved and I read through this, I didn't know what a eunuch was. And I didn't know what it was to be castrated. I thought they literally cut off their you-know-what. And they could never have relations. That, no, castration is cutting off the testicles. Yeah. And if you're a farmer, what they do when the cows are born, if it's a male and they don't want it to be a stud, they'll take a rubber band and put it around the testicles. And eventually the testicles will just fall off. So a eunuch is someone who has no testicles. If, it sounds weird saying that word, but it's in the Bible. So if you don't have testicles, you're not going to have children, are you? So what is a eunuch? Well, all throughout history, there have been eunuchs. And when a man comes in and conquers a land, he doesn't want his bride to get pregnant with some other man's seed. So he would take the men that would wait upon his bride and he would castrate them. So that he would never have to worry about whose son was his. You know what I'm saying? And so we see that. And matter of fact, in the Old Testament, we see that. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 9. There was an evil woman named Jezebel. And Jezebel was just full of the devil. I mean, to this day, how many people name their kids Jezebel? I mean, very few. Now, there, there's probably some. But 2 Kings chapter 9 and verse 30 and when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tired her head and looked out at a window. So makeup, first mention of makeup in the Bible, right? And, uh, and when, as Jehu entered in at the gate, he said, Had Zimri peace, who slew his master? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. Now you know the rest of the story. They threw her out the window. Because she was such an evil woman and the dogs came and ate everything but her hands and her feet. Because she went places she shouldn't have gone and she did things with her hand that she shouldn't have done. But she had a bunch of eunuchs around her. Now you would think she would have a bunch of women attending upon her. Like if you were a, a, a woman queen, well you'd have all the, the women, what would they, there was a name for that in the Middle Ages, the, the women that would wait upon ladies in waiting or something, I forget. But why does she have a bunch of guys around? Well, I think the answer is in Revelation. So let's go to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 20. I think that she was such a wicked, vile, ungodly woman that she was constantly adulterating against her husband. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 20, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants. To do what? To commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So look at Jezebel, and you look at her now as what she really was. She wanted all the fun of adultery and fornication without any risk of getting pregnant. So she got these guys, and she castrated them. But then she did fornication with them. So she was a very, very wicked woman who cheated on her husband. Literally would have divorced him that way. So now you know what that is, what a eunuch is. But what on earth does this text mean? What on earth is Jesus saying in verse 12? There are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb. How many kids are born that are males that don't have testes? I'm not a doctor. I don't know of any studies. But I guess sometimes that happens. I guess there are some yeah. deformities. I guess that can happen. And there are some eunuchs which are made eunuchs of men. Okay, They were captured in war and made that. And there be some eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. <laughs> Wait a minute. Does that mean Paul did that to himself? Put a rubber band around it? I mean, I, I don't know what that means. But it says for the kingdom of heaven's sake. It's out here. So is Jesus again talking about as you go through the tribulation, endure to the end, make sure you don't commit any kind of adultery or anything like that so you can make it into the millennial kingdom? Is that the application there? I don't know. I don't know. But uh, that is interesting. That is very interesting. What a weird thing to say. 
And yeah, he that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Well, I can't receive it. I'm happy the way I am, <laughs> so I'm going to keep going the way we're going. Thank God I'm married and, and uh, not about to castrate myself. Amen. But I, honestly, another verse that I don't know what to tell you, except that's just what Jesus said. So now verse 13. Now we have children. Then were there brought unto him little children that he should put his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked them. Now what on earth is this? All these kids wanted to come to Jesus, and the disciples rebuked them. So the disciples are telling the kids, stay away, stay away. <laughs> Why? Why were they so adamant we don't want children to bother Jesus? I don't understand that either. But yet Jesus loved the children. As I was reading this, I thought to myself, maybe it's because all these sick people were here, and they didn't want the kids to get sick, mingle with the sick people. Maybe they wanted all the sick people to get healed first before the kids. I don't know what's going on here. I'm just I'm reading and I'm trying to figure out. But maybe that was their thought. Maybe they meant well. No, you guys stand over here. Leave them alone. Jesus is busy healing people. Maybe maybe that's what it was. But Jesus needed some rest from this healing stuff. Right. So how many people like kids? I love kids. Kids are fun. So Jesus is like, yeah, come on over, kids. And he prayed for them. Now, there's no text in the Bible for, uh, in the, that I can find in the New Testament for a baby dedication. But in some churches, they have what they call a baby dedication. Have you ever heard of that? And you bring your newborn, or, or maybe it's a couple months old, and they, the whole church prays for that child. And that was something my mom did many, many years ago when I was just a baby. And she took me forward for a baby dedication. Now, I don't know if the Lord chose that, and that's why I'm serving Him today. I don't know. But there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with a baby dedication. That's a good thing. But Jesus took these children, and look what it says. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. That's verse 15. Now let me back up to verse 14. But Jesus said, Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come unto me. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. Funny word, suffer. <laughs> you have kids, do you? You suffer with them, do you? Uh, kids bring a little bit of suffering. They're not easy. So, and by the way, that's the first word that Jesus uses in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 15 is suffer. And suffer means to allow, but it's kind of funny. It also means go through some stuff. <laughs> so if you have kids, you, you probably suffered a time or two. Things that, I mean, why don't kids do what you do? Why do they have to be such an inconvenience all the time? Thanks, Dad. Right? You're welcome. I mean, you're driving down the road, taking a vacation, you're happy. All of a sudden, you're, you're like, this is great. And then you hear, in the back seat. And you look back there and say, oh, we got to pull over and we got to clean this up. And then it stinks for the whole rest of the drive. You got all the windows. Up. You ever been through stuff like that? So, yeah, I guess, I guess you do suffer with children. Okay. So, Jesus says, suffer little children, forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Well, again, there's the kingdom of heaven. So, children and the kingdom of heaven. What, why would, well, do you remember what happens in the millennial kingdom? It says, I believe it's either Isaiah or Ezekiel. I think it's Isaiah, where it says, a child shall die at 100 years old. So, the curse comes off the earth, and they won't age like we do. Beginning of the Bible, they live to be almost 1,000 years old. The people that make it in there will live to be that. And when they're a hundred, they still look like a child. So that's my thought on that. That's just an interesting thought. So let's continue here. And verse 15 says, And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. So what did he do? He probably prayed for them. He probably did what I do, as you know, take a head and you go like this on the top of a child's head. Or grab them like this and go like this. That's called scob the noggin. I'm scobbing this noggin. Oh, the kids love that. Not really. But anyway, they did that to me when I was a kid, and that's fun to do to kids. Anyway, so he had fun. I don't believe he's a pedophile. I don't believe that Jesus did anything wrong to the children. Some people read the Bible, and because they have a dirty mind, they think things like this. And so people that are that go to passages like this to try to prove Things like that. No, Jesus was innocent. He was just. He was righteous. And he's dealing with these children in a just, righteous way. And he was a great role model for them to look up to. Okay? And so he's he just, and, and I don't know about you, but kids are fun. In Honduras, man, I couldn't keep them off me. I'd go and have all the kids come. They'd sit on your lap and they'd talk to you. And they're fun. 
And it's fun because it makes you young again. <laughs> Sometimes I can't tell you how many places I've been in Honduras and the kids are like, come on, come on. We go over there. They show me all their games. There was one thing in Honduras that was so weird, and I wish I knew what the name of it was, but it was a tree, and the kids would pull off these little round things that looked like cranberries, and they had a little bamboo stick, and they'd put it in there, and then they'd, I can't remember how they did it, but or they, yeah, they, they pulled it somehow back to where the pressure would bind up, and that thing would go and shoot out the end and splatter. And that was just, I was like, wow, and I was pow, pow, doing it. It was a lot of fun. So it's fun to be a child. It is. And you can learn a lot from a child, believe it or not. But they should be learning a lot from you. All right, verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him. Now here we have the importance of dispensations. Because what we're about to see, remember, this is all taking place right here before the cross. And Jesus gives this guy a works gospel. Why on earth would Jesus tell this guy that comes to him, do good works to go to heaven? That's not for us today because it's a different dispensation. And there is a reason why Jesus said this and we see it in Paul. So what does it say here? Verse 16, and behold, one came and said unto him, good master, what good thing shall I do that I might have eternal life? How do I get eternal life by works, by doing something? Jesus didn't go, well, Paul said, because <laughs> Paul hadn't showed up yet. And Jesus didn't say, well, just believe in me, like he says in the book of John. Jesus told this guy, you got to do these works. Works gospel. You go over here, Muldoon, I think it is, over in Pensacola. You drive down Muldoon, there's a church on the side of the road. This is the verse on the side of that church. And it's sad that they believe that today it's by works. They only go to this chapter. They don't go to the rest of the Bible. Paul says it's not of works, lest any man should boast. But here's what he says. Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Are we saved by keeping the commandments? So why on earth would Jesus say this? And by the way, what is he saying there? He says there is none good, no, not one, right? Like Paul says, except for God. So is Jesus saying, I'm God? I'm the only good one? Because you're calling me good. Nobody's good but God. So are you saying I'm God? That's what it sounds like he's saying. I don't know if the guy caught it. But look what else Jesus says. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He doesn't say eternal life, does he? So if you want to keep living a good life, because this is still before the cross, then keep following the commandments. Not keep the commandments to get to heaven. But remember, a lot of this is over here. So tribulation, you follow those commandments to get into life in the millennial kingdom. So do you see that application? So this is not for us today. This is definitely dispensations. Now, why would Jesus tell this guy this? Now, let me read a little bit more here. Verse um, 18, he said to him, which, which commandments? Jesus does not answer all 10 commandments. Isn't that funny? And he doesn't answer, keep the Sabbath. I wonder why he left that out. He only answers five, and then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. So verse 18 says, He saith unto them, which, Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect... <laughs> If you're going to be perfect, if that will be perfect, boy, that's, can you do that? I've never done that yet. I wish I was. Well, only through Christ am I perfect, through his imputed righteousness. Amen, Ray? It's through that. Go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. What is this? Communism? I mean, what the, what is, why is Jesus saying that? But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So again, this is before the cross. And it sounds like this is a lot to do with over here. Because over here, what do you do? Well, you don't get to keep it all. You've got to flee into the wilderness if you're one of those Jews. So you can't be trusting in riches over here. Book of James talks about your, your, um, your money is corrupt and stuff like this. So I see that. If you go to Hebrews 9.16, it says, The testament doesn't start until the death of a testator. So here's where Jesus dies. So Jesus is giving this guy a works gospel before he dies. Why? 
Paul tells us if we'll go over to Galatians chapter 3. The reason that Jesus tells this man this is because it's not the dispensation yet of grace completely. And it's still, maybe they could still accept him as Messiah or not. And the kingdom could have come sooner. But Galatians chapter 3 verse 22 but the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. For after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So today we're saved by faith. Faith in the blood. That is after the cross. Before that faith, before, under the time of the law, the law was the schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. So Jesus is telling this guy, if you will do these things, if you will do these commandments, then what will happen? Eventually, when he does die on the cross, it will lead him to who Jesus is so that over here he can get saved. So I do not believe that Jesus is telling us in our dispensation we're saved by keeping the commandments. He was telling him that, knowing that if he did keep them, that it would be the schoolmaster that would ultimately lead him to here, so that in this dispensation he'd get saved. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's the easiest way to explain that. What does Romans 10.4 say? Christ is the end of the law to all who believe. So we're not under the Old Testament law. Uh, Romans 6, 14 says we're not under the law. We're under grace. And then Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it is not the law, it is not keeping the commandments that saves us today. And everyone that tries to prove that it is, they're in the wrong dispensation. Because that's still before Jesus died. Amen? Do you all see that? So what a sad thing to think of that church over on Muldoon Street. And they're trying to do the works gospel. And they're saying, but Jesus said it. And they're not reading the rest of the Bible. They're over here in Windows 98. And they haven't updated to what? In Windows 11. I mean, that, that's the best way to explain that. So they don't see Paul in the Bible for a reason. How sad. How sad. Okay. So back to Matthew chapter 19. Let's try to finish this up. Um, Matthew chapter 19. And I just... Uh, Man, I just want people to understand that. And yet there are people out there that say there's no such thing as dispensations. Then we have a great problem because Paul says one thing and here Jesus says the exact opposite. Which one are you going to follow? Well, a lot of people say, well, I follow Jesus. But Paul says he follows Jesus. And he says something completely different. There must be dispensations. And that's why Jesus says this here. But we're not here. We're there. And so it's changed. All right, Matthew chapter 19 and um, verse, no reason to, to go back and read what we just read. So let me um, start there in verse 23, okay? So that rich young man didn't even want to come to Jesus. It made it very clear in this dispensation. So did he even get saved in that one? We don't know. But it says in verse uh, 21, then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, the kingdom of heaven is the millennial kingdom. So a rich man will hardly enter into that. Why? Because no man can buy or sell without the mark of the beast. So if you want to be rich in that time, <laughs> then you take that mark. How do you enter into that? But see, a lot of people read this passage through the eyes of we're here today, so it's for us today. Okay, so if we want to spiritually apply that to today, it's hard for somebody that has a lot of money to get saved because they're trusted in their money instead of trusting in God. But um, look what he says here in verse 24. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now notice how it switches from kingdom of heaven to kingdom of God. This is a perfect example of a figurative passage. <laughs> Because as far as I know, that's never happened. You take a needle, and I can't even see the eye now. I'm starting to have to use those horrible, oh, I feel old, having, like you guys are doing. Put on your reading glasses. But how do you take a human being and shove them through the eye of a needle? You can't. So this is obviously figurative. And you take the Bible literally as much as you can until you come to a place where you can't. So this is an illustration of, of a figurative. And, and I guess you could say, perhaps, it's a little bit of sarcasm. 
Jesus is being a little sarcastic, kind of, I guess. That's what my old pastor called this, sarcasm, but I don't know. But in verse um, 25, when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? So they're like, what? He's saying we're saved by keeping the commandments, but now you got to sell everything you have? I mean, that's what he told them, sell what you have. They're sitting there going, my, my, what is Jesus telling us to do here now? And they're kind of like freaking out a little bit. Because, you know, they, they wanted to have a house and place to live and things like things we take for granted. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. OK, so anything is possible with God. He could even put a human being through the eye of a needle. I don't know how he could do that, but he could do that. So with God, all things are possible. What is the context? Being saved. So who is it that can possibly save someone? Not us getting saved by what we do. He's the one that can save us by what he does. And as we read the context here and the cross reference, we're going to see that's obviously what he's referring to is that he is salvation and he is the one that's going to do everything possible to save us. Now we come and accept it by faith. So it says here as we finish up here. Then answered Peter and said unto him, verse 27, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Now you remember they're all fighting over the kingdom and wanting to get in the kingdom and saying, I'll be the greatest and all this stuff. Peter just comes out and says, look, we're keeping the commandments. We got rid of all our stuff. We can't even buy enough bread to eat. <laughs> have to go take some little boy's fishes. I mean, what on earth do we get from all this? Right? That's what he's saying. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Wow. So he finally says, yeah, you guys are going to sit with me. That's out here. So when Jesus uh, comes back at the rapture, I guess Matthew... John, all those, Peter, all those guys, they go up here. They come back with a glorified body, and there will literally be 12 thrones around Jesus that they're sitting in. And if you went to Jerusalem in that time, you'd see Jesus on the throne, and you'd get to meet Peter. You'd get to meet John. and You'd get to meet all these guys. But Judas will be missing, <laughs> right? So that's 11 thrones. So who's on the other throne? I think Paul. Some people go, no, Matthias, Matthias. Well, they chose Matthias, but it doesn't say God chose him. They chose them by casting lots. <laughs> that sounds like gambling. Well, let's shoot some, you know, gamble here and see who's the next apostle. That doesn't sound like the way God wanted it done. So I think Paul will be sitting there too. But they will literally be sitting with Jesus in his kingdom. And now they hear it and they're like, oh, wow. But then it says here in verse 29, And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. Now what on earth is inheriting everlasting life? And why do you forsake your family? See how that sounds horrible? <laughs> Unless it's right here, the Jews in the tribulation having to forsake anybody that takes the mark of the beast, and say, no, I'm choosing Jesus. I'm going into the wilderness to hide from the Antichrist. And then they come into here, they get to live here, and then if they're saved through here, they inherit eternal life. Okay, so does that make sense to you? And then it says in the last, um, last verse, but many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Now in Luke chapter 22, let's turn over there to a cross reference. Luke chapter 22. And by the way, it says the regeneration, which is like the restoration. So that's God's restoration, of the millennial kingdom. Um, Luke chapter 22, verse 28 through 30 says this, what we just read, Luke 22, 28. And it says, Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations, and I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father has appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So that must be in the millennial kingdom. So now let's go to Mark chapter 10. And I want to read all of Mark chapter 10 because this is the cross reference. And I want to say all. Well, I'll cut it off. We want to read the very end of it. But I want you to read Mark chapter 10, verse 1 through 45, because again, we get extra information. And verse 45 ties this whole thing together. Alrighty? 
Just, wow, I'm getting goosebumps. <laughs> okay, Mark chapter 10, and verse 1. So we're going to read what we already read in Matthew 19. Cross-reference. See if there's any added details here that we didn't get in Matthew. Mark chapter 10, verse 1. And he arose from thence, and cometh unto the coast of Judea by the farther side of Jordan. And the people resort unto him again. And as he was wont, he taught them again. So he's coming down here to the far side of Jordan. So he's right over here. Okay. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away, because she had committed adultery. Now he can write a bill of divorcement. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh, so then they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. If you're a man, never go sleep with another man's wife, because you're causing a divorce. Don't put asunder what God joined together. Amen? That's what it says. And in the house his disciples ask him again of the same manner, and he saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. And they brought young children to him, that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. So they wanted him to touch their children. Why? Well, you remember that one woman? She had this thing in her, and she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. There's something about when God touches you <laughs> that it, it heals you. Well, kids don't need to be healed, but maybe it will help them later in life. I don't know. There's just something about that. They wanted the king to touch their child. So probably put his hand on their head or something. And they brought young children to him that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, now remember it was kingdom of heaven in the other place, kingdom of God here. So we looked at that last week. You get saved, you're like a babe in Christ, remember, like a child. And it says, um, where was I, verse 15. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms and put his hands upon them and blessed them. So he's giving them hugs too. Amen. Amen. Probably kissing them. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Hmm, an inheritance. Isn't that interesting? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not under thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. <laughs> now, if you try to apply that to today, then we can't own a house, we can't own a car, we gotta, I guess we got to be Amish, right? We've got to sell everything we have. I mean, you can't tell me that's the gospel for today. That's a different dispensation, right? And, uh, and he was sad at that saying and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answereth again, And saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible. So it's impossible for you to get saved without Jesus. It's impossible for your works to get saved. So why would Jesus tell them to do these works if it's impossible to be saved? Because he knew it was the schoolmaster that would bring him to him over here. And it says, With men is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospels. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions in the world to come eternal life. 
So remember, it's the world to come. See, it's a different dispensation. But many that are first shall be last and the last first. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And he again took the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto them. What were they afraid of? Verse 30 sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Verse 30, you shall receive all this. And then it says, and persecutions. <laughs> That doesn't, that's kind of like, yeah, I want the brethren and sisters and mothers and lands. And no, I don't want the persecute. So that might be what they're afraid of. Oh, we're going to be persecuted. And then it says, and he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priest and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. And shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto him, saying, Master, we would, yeah, verse 35, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand, and the other on thy left hand, in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? And they say unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, You shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with all shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased. Okay? We didn't read the rest of this last week. So from verse 42 to verse 45, watch what this says. Verse 42, But Jesus called them to him and said unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever you will be of the chiefest shall be servant of all. Now look at verse 45. This part is not in Matthew 19. And this is the part that I just love that gives me goosebumps. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So he's sitting there talking about riches. <laughs> what are riches? Well, you know how you, a ransom, you know, you kidnap somebody and you ask for a ransom for money. And a ransom is a payment for something. And usually it's a payment of money. But in this case, it's the payment for our sins. And Jesus Christ is to be the ransom for many. So Jesus knows that he is going to have to die. Let's close with 1 Timothy chapter 2. Because we see Paul in agreement. And Paul uses the same term of Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And Jesus Christ is our ransom. He is our payment for our sins. And we are not saved by keeping the commandments. He told that young ruler to do that because in the next dispensation, he would find Christ as the schoolmaster. This is what we're saved by, what Jesus did. He is the way of salvation. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 through 6. 1 Timothy 2, 4 is speaking about the Savior. Verse 3, verse 4 says, Who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. It wasn't quite time to testify of that. So it's still leading up to that. So when he's telling this guy, keep the commandments, do works, that's not for us today. It's not works. It's the work of Christ. And he paid for our sins on the cross. And he is our ransom. And we are only saved through him. So you cannot save yourself. It's impossible through your works to save yourself. It's only through what he did to save us. Amen? So, wow, that came together pretty well. Okay, any questions or comments? Amen? What do you think? Questions or comments? Yes, sir. Two questions. Born the Old Testament, uh, from what I read, is it like looking forward to Christ? And that's why the blood that they used, it wasn't, you know, forgiveness of sins. It was just looking forward to Christ, right before the, the cross. Okay, so. In other words, it was like looking back. There's a lot of people that oversimplify the Bible, and they say it like this. In the Old Testament, they were looking forward to the cross, and in the New Testament, we look back to the cross. That is an oversimplification of a lot of things, and that's an 
overly simplified way to say it, but it doesn't, it's not, well, it's, it's probably not. To yeah, not when they say it like this, you're saved in the Old Testament by looking forward to the cross, you're saved by looking back. That's not exactly true because nobody in the Old Testament knew anything about a cross. A cross showed up with the Romans. They had no idea what a cross was. Right. Maybe a little bit before. I mean, if you were Egyptian, it would have looked more like <laughs> that right there, you know. But, they did but know also, the they, knew that they knew to look forward to the Messiah, but no one knew his name. So no one in the Old Testament went around saying, well, I just believe in Jesus. Because three times the angel of the Lord shows up, Jesus, and they ask his name. Manoah, the father of Samson, here comes the angel of the Lord, says, what's your name? So zip, didn't tell him. Um, then you have uh, uh, Jacob, and Jacob is wrestling with the angel of the Lord. He says, what's your name? And the Lord says, what's your name? He goes, Jacob. What does Jacob mean? It means deceiver. It's like, hey, you just deceived your father, right? And lied. Oh, I'm confessing my sin. And then the other one is in the book of Proverbs. And it says in the book of Proverbs, Solomon is speaking. He says, what is God's name and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? We know, we know now that it's Jesus, but nobody in the Old Testament knew that until right here when it showed up and it says, the angel says, thou shalt call his name Jesus. So no one in the Old Testament was trusting in Jesus looking forward to the cross. They were looking for a king. They were looking for the king to show up. Also, the blood that was shed was the blood of an animal, not the blood of Jesus. So there are some people out there that preach people are saved the same way in the whole Bible. And they say things like that. They're saved in the Old Testament by looking forward to the cross. They're saved in the New Testament by looking. And that's an oversimplification. And that's not exactly true. Some people in the Old Testament were saved by works. All right. Adam and Eve. Don't eat of the tree. What did you say, Lord? I said, don't eat of the. Uh, you know, that was a work. Thou shalt not. And they did it. So they blew it. How was Noah saved? What if God says, no, I'm going to destroy the earth in 120 years. He goes, okay, Lord, I'm just, you've, I found grace in your eyes, so I'm good. And God says, no, no, go build the boat. No, no, I'm good. <laughs> I, I believe I have eternal security. I'm not going to build a boat. Would we, any of us be here right now? He had to do that of building that boat. So all throughout the Bible, we have dispensations. Turn over to Hebrews real quick. And this is one of the biggest battles you have with a lot of people. They don't believe in dispensations. They think the whole Bible, everybody's just saved the same way. Well, no one was saved by trusting in Jesus in the Old Testament because they didn't even know the name of Jesus. So you've got to understand. Now, the only way you can make that work is when they died and went down here to Abraham's bosom, they were waiting for the coming Messiah to save them. And when Jesus came, he did save them. But again, they didn't know his name and they weren't trusting his blood because they were trusting in the blood of animals. But Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 shows us dispensations. God who at sundry times, all right, sundry means various or different, and in divers manners, divers means different, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So God spoke to people in different times and different ways in the Old Testament. So it's never been the same through the whole Bible, because over here it's faith and works. They have to endure to the end. In the millennium, it looks like pure works. Because what is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We can only have faith because we can't see Him yet. When you see God, you don't need faith because you're looking right at Him. So faith is for today. Where's faith over here? If He's literally sitting on a throne. So this is what people call dispensational salvation. And I don't really like that term because... Really, nobody was saved in the Old Testament until Jesus came and saved them and pulled them out of Abraham's book. So they were safe down here if they obeyed works, but they didn't get saved until Jesus took them up when he rose from the dead. So don't oversimplify it as many preachers do. And a lot of them, a lot of it comes from the Southern Baptists. And many Southern Baptists don't believe in dispensations, unfortunately. And they'll say, people are saved the same in the whole Bible. In the Old Testament, they just look forward to the cross. In the New Testament, they just look back. Well, that's leaving out the tribulation. That's leaving out the millennium. That's leaving out back here under the Old Testament law. It says, this shall be your righteousness, keeping the law. 
No, our righteousness today is imputed righteousness through Christ. So do you see back then it was works involved? Over here it's not works. It's faith alone. Now after we're saved, then we do works because we want to, not because we have to. So you've got to understand that. You've got to understand dispensations and how important it is to understand how important that is. One other thing go along with that. Paul says that the cross was a mystery that was kept secret since the Yeah, began. right, right. So, and then... So a lot of these people, they don't understand that for whatever reason, God chose blood, the shedding of blood being something for forgiveness. That Adam and Eve, whenever God made them coats of skin, he shed blood to make those coats of skin. Right. So every sin, even from the first sin of Adam and Eve, it required the shedding yeah, it was of blood. A foreshadow. Yeah. So. Yep. And so these guys, and I have to debate them all the time, they always say, no, it's the same in the whole Bible. Everyone's saved the same way. Right. And so I said, okay. Can I ask you one question? How were they saved in the Old Testament? Was it through blood sacrifice? They say, yes, through blood atonement. Okay. Animal blood. Yes. All right. Jesus shed his blood. Is Jesus an animal? No. Jesus is God. So that's God's blood. Is that the same blood? They say, no. I said, so it's not the same. Okay. That's how you win that argument. It's always been salvation through blood, but it's a different blood. It was Jesus' blood is the only way that can save us. Not bull, blood of bull and goats, bulls and goats, like it says in Hebrews, but through the blood of Jesus. So you cannot say it's always been the same through the whole Bible. It doesn't make sense. It's an oversimplification, and it's, it's really leaving a lot out. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I, I forget the reference here, but so in, in the Old Testament, they, they did trust the blood of animals and stuff. They trusted in the shedding of the blood of the lambs, but they didn't even understand that they were going to look, they didn't understand the cross at all. They didn't know it was coming. And to that point, who was it? Was in the carriage and he, the after. Uh, yes, that, one, that guy. He was reading that and he didn't even understand the passage that it was talking about the lamb being led to the slaughter. And right. To have that explained to him. So. Even in the Old Testament, they, they had no idea. So what was Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding, right, Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission or no forgiveness of sins. So it was the blood of an animal, but today it's the blood of Jesus, who the Bible calls the Lamb of God, which taketh away our sins. So every sacrifice of an animal or a lamb in the Old Testament was a type pointing to that. But when they were doing that, they weren't going, and this is Jesus. They had no idea. So you said, uh, let's go to Acts chapter 7, I believe it is. And they, they began to see that after it took place, after Jesus died. And the first person to see that was right before Paul was this guy named Philip talking to an Ethiopian. And it says in chapter 7, is it? Is it chapter 7 or 8? No, it's chapter 8, excuse me. Chapter 8. Chapter 8. And look at verse 30. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Esaias, which is Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Okay, so this Ethiopian eunuch was reading. And eunuch, here's eunuch again. We talk about a eunuch today. He was reading through the book of Isaiah. And he says, I don't understand what I'm reading here. And then he says here, verse 31, And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. This is Isaiah 53. Now, we're not going to read all of Isaiah 53, but there's your homework. Amen. Do that later today, because you can't help but see Jesus Christ in Isaiah chapter 53. And it says that he shall justify many through when he bear their sins. Jesus bore our sins on the cross. Yes, ma'am? Is that the one that they don't, they skept it on, not, never read? Yeah, many of your Jews in many synagogues, they say that's the passage we don't read. Okay. And they say it's about the Messiah, but it's a mystery to us. We don't understand it. And you can go to Israel, you can go to the places and ask Jews to read it. Say, doesn't that sound like Jesus bearing the sins of many on the cross? They're like, oh, I never thought of that. So why don't they read it? I think when Moses and Elijah show up, that's probably the first passage they'll turn to. They'll be like, scrolls, you know, open the scroll, Isaiah 53, you know, maybe that's the first thing they read. But um, the lamb to the slaughter is Jesus Christ. And they didn't understand that. 
all of a sudden they start to get it, connect the dots. Then comes Paul. And the big thing that God showed Paul was this word right here, justified. You are justified by, and, and you know what? We need to read this real quick. Acts chapter 13, verse 38 and 39. Because this is what God revealed to Paul. And this proves, because you know there's going to be people probably in, in the comments trying to uh, say, no, we are saved by works and keeping the commandments. This proves the different dispensation. Acts 13, 38 and 39. And it says, Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, that's Jesus Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe faith are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Yet here Jesus said in Matthew 19, no, you've got to keep the law. Here God revealed to Paul, no, it's not the law, the keeping of the law that saves you. So why do we have what looks like an apparent contradiction? The only way that's not a contradiction is if it's a different dispensation. And because they rejected the Messiah, God says, okay, we're going to do it this way now until... I take out the church, then we're going to go back to this way right here. And it'll probably be get back under the law, Jews, so you'll see that that's Jesus. And that's what it's all about. So you've got to understand that it's not works that saves us today. It's faith only. So it's not saved the same way in the whole Bible. And boy, that makes people mad. But like I said, they oversimplify the Bible. If you read it, you can't see it like that. You see, no, it's different. It's different. Good point. Good point. Anybody else? You just said it, though, that people aren't saved the same way, but they weren't saved in the Old Testament. Yeah. They, but you can they were saved. So that, for years I would call it dispensational salvation because that's what my old pastor called it. I kind of shy away from that now because, like Laura said, no one was saved back here <laughs> because, all right, no here's, here's hell and here's Abraham's bosom, Okay. In the Old Testament, if a person obeyed what God said, their soul went down here. If they didn't, their soul went down here. Were they saved down here? Paul tells us what salvation is, and it's seven different things. That's a good video to look up on YouTube, the seven things that Paul calls salvation. It's being born again. Was anybody born again in the Old Testament? No, it's getting God's imputed righteousness. Well, that happened to Abraham, but we don't see that happening to other people. Um, it, except David, um, then it's, it's all these other things. I can't it's being washed in the blood. Were people washed in the blood? So when they died, they were safe. Their souls were safe down here, but they weren't quite saved yet. And do you know why they weren't saved yet? The book of Hebrews. Look what it says. Book of Hebrews. Don't you want a good Bible study? We, I can do this all day, right? No. Um, I, I want chapter 12. I believe, and then there's another verse. Ray, if you could look it up, where it says the author of eternal salvation. Where's that? But in, in Hebrews 12, it says in verse 2, looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Okay, so Jesus is the author of our faith. So in order for him to author it, he had to write it. This is where he did what he did for us to put our faith in. But where's that verse I'm looking for that says that Jesus is the author of eternal salvation? So if Jesus is the author of eternal salvation, doesn't that mean there's no salvation until Jesus? Yes. And if that's... Which one? Hebrews 1.6. 1, I thought it was farther on. No. So if He is the author of eternal salvation, then these people's souls were just safe down here, waiting for Him to come. So, and they were looking forward, but they didn't know the name Jesus. They didn't know he died on the cross. They, they were looking forward to being saved. There it is. 5 9. Okay, yeah, that sounds right. Hebrews 5 9. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And how do you obey him? You obey the gospel by believing, because it's all in the context. So, Jesus is the author of eternal salvation. So, really, there was no salvation until here on. <laughs> you know? And all the Old Testament saints finally got saved. When he died and was buried, he took them out when he rose again and took them up to heaven. So that's when they were officially saved and got their glorified bodies. So really, it's kind of hard for me to use that term, dispensational salvation, because they really weren't saved in the Old Testament. They were safe down there, but they weren't saved yet. So. Yeah, people, you, when you count, yeah, there are, there's nothing 
that we can do or that person can do to be saved, but only to believe in what Jesus did. His right. death, burial, resurrection. Right. And the blood he shed is what saves us from our sins. And that he, you know, uh, we were justified, saved by his blood. Right. And that, and that's all we have to believe. Exactly. And they just look at you like, well, that's unbelievable. Right. Yeah. Because it's too simple. It's too simple. And the Bible calls it the simplicity of salvation. If there was anything we could do to get to heaven, we get to heaven and guess what? For all eternity, we'd be bragging on what we did to get there. So God says, that's out of the picture. It's never going to be that. So Jesus did everything he could possibly do. He went beyond what he could do so that we can never make it about us. It's always, okay, you saved me so I can praise you for all eternity. So people that are trusting in what they did, they're thinking, I'm better than Jesus. See how that's blasphemy? So God said, I'm going to make it so simple. All I want is your heart. I want you to believe. Just like getting marriage, getting back to marriage. I do. Accept me. Faith. That simple. That's salvation. But he yes. had a, a, a word that it means a lot that obeys him. Mm -hmm. That kind of, you know. Right. They did obey him. But if you don't obey him, but he said, if you love me, you obey my commandments. So okay. He has a little, you know. All right. So, so well, someone will read that and think, yeah, well, it's through works that you got to obey him. Exactly. But you go to Romans chapter 10 and it tells us that it's through obeying is believing. You obey the gospel. Uh -huh. So Romans chapter 10, the way you believe the gospel is, I mean, the way you obey him is believe the gospel. Uh, Romans chapter 10. Um, is it 16? Yeah. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So right there, obeying is believing. When you believe the gospel, you have obeyed. Uh, Romans 10, 16. And the next verse says, faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So we hear the Bible preached and the Bible tells us, trust in the blood for salvation. Trust what Jesus did. When you believe that through faith, then you've obeyed the gospel. So that's the obedience that saves us, is believing. It's not a work. Do you realize the only thing you can do that's not a work is belief? And that's really the only thing you can do that you can't brag about. <laughs> yeah, because you accept his vow that he made. Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. Two part question. Yes, ma'am. So, even in the Old Testament, those people they got to Abraham's bosom by faith and works, but they didn't. They're not getting to heaven by. They're still getting to heaven by Jesus. So, right. Well, here's my two part question. So Jesus went down and preached, right? Right. That's in Peter how he preached to them so, that were down here. Mm -hmm. Is there a possibility that some of those people in Abraham's bosom didn't believe? See, that I don't know, because it doesn't say in the Bible that they didn't. In Abraham's bosom, it says hell hath enlarged itself. So it was completely emptied. So they would have gone over here if they didn't. If they didn't. I mean, they must have all believed. That's all I can say. Yeah. Was there a possibility he preached to the people in hell and they did believe? Oh, I heard it. Well, even if they did, they were there for a reason. So that would be purgatory. They paid for their sins. Then they would get to heaven by their own. So it doesn't sound like that could be, even if they did, they're there. Like he preached to the spirits, which were the fallen angels. Well, they can't be saved. But the lost souls, they had their chance. I don't see God giving them a, a second chance. I just don't see that. So I think you only get one chance. But there's nothing, no verses. You there are no have verses have. that say that. No, uh -uh, that I can think of. Right, he did. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I had, uh, people say that. You know, when you die now, you go to a paradise. You don't go to heaven. And I said, no, paradise was was like Abraham's bosom. Mm -hmm. and it was engulfed by hell. Right. You go to heaven. Is there anything else that I can say? Well, that was Old Testament. And I believe, look that up, Ray, is it was Isaiah 55, 11. Um, it was called paradise. Luke chapter 16 tells you Abraham's bosom was called paradise. It, Paul tells us um, captivity was led captive. Okay, those people that were here were in captivity. They went to heaven. Then when Paul goes to heaven, he says, I was caught up to paradise. 
So that means all that is now up there. So that's not here anymore. Second now, uh, in Isaiah 55, 11, I think is the verse that says, Hell hath enlarged itself. So that was emptied up, and then this now it's only hell below us. So I wouldn't even confuse people by going back to that, unless they're already confused, but say, no, no, paradise is heaven. You either go to heaven or hell today. There's no other place. It's to be present from the Lord. That's what you're going to read, right? Yeah. Is it is Isaiah 55, 11? Is that the... But that was the verse you were going to read, right? No. Nope. Yeah, I was going to read the Second Corinthians. Maybe it's five, Isaiah five eleven. Anyway, there's a verse that, that says, "Hell hath enlarged itself." Now, when would that have taken place? When everybody in Abraham's bosom, right? When everyone in Abraham's bosom got out. Nope, I can't find the verse. I wanted the verse. Okay, fourteen, five fourteen. Therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. So. Hell now is at the center of the earth. There is no paradise down there. It's all hell. And everybody who's not saved goes down there. And that's why we want people to get saved. That's why we preach what we do so they don't go down there. So they go up there when they die. Isaiah 5.14. Isaiah 5.14. Hell hath enlarged itself. In Spanish it's saying chancho. It got like, it got bigger. It's just, I don't know. It's a different word. I just think of Sancho Panza when I hear that word. Okay. Anybody else? I know we've gone long today. Yes, sir. I do. I, I, we talked offline. But my question is, is uh, in the Old Testament, people either went to hell or, or, um, or Abraham's glory. Right. So my question is, it says there's none righteous, no, not one. No, no one's not without sin. So the question is, is what was the difference between the people that went to Abraham's bosom and those that went to Right, so... I think I know, but could you, you know. It must have been that blood sacrifice. Yeah. So, but also, God was so great. If you sinned, you'd bring a sacrifice for your sin. Yes. What if you sin tomorrow and then you die and you didn't have a chance to bring another one? Exactly. In Israel, when they were under the law, there were individual sacrifices and then there was a sacrifice for the whole nation yeah. every year. Yeah. So, yeah. let's say I... Uh, I'm an Israelite and I'm doing right and I sin and I bring my individual sacrifice, but oh, I went and sinned again. Well, that sacrifice for the whole year, maybe God would have counted that and put me over here. Okay. Maybe. I don't, I'm not saying for sure, but yeah. I think it still had to be through blood atonement that got you down here. What if I was like a Canaanite trying to do right by God? So if they were so heathen? He 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 right. So first of all, he gave us a conscience to follow, yes. but also, um, he would talk to people back then. God would show up in person and talk to people. That doesn't happen today. But when the Jews were in there, you could convert to Judaism as well. So if you were a pagan and you wanted God, he says he's, you see him everywhere. You would seek after God and you'll be found of him. I believe that was the verse that seek him shall, shall find him. So if you were a pagan and you chose not to fall into fornication, adultery, wickedness, you know, drinking blood and murdering people, you, wanted, you would find God, you would find him. Or he'd find you. Yeah. And now how that entailed exactly, he probably would have told them like he told Adam and Eve, look, this is what I demand when you sin is a sacrifice for your sins. And they would have had to get away from the pagans. So it was very hard for people that were pagans to see anything other than that. They thought that was great every day. So unfortunately, a lot of them were damned to begin with. But if they did follow their conscience, God did bring them away. So there's not, people, that's one of the main points that people bring out against God. Well, he's just a mean God that puts everyone in hell. No, people put themselves in hell by their sins. Yeah. But God put a conscience in you. And if you follow that conscience, you don't have to go to hell. He made a way here. He made a way back then the for them to are, find out. Everybody violated their conscience too. For sure. And, and you, you won't find anybody in hell that God is not completely justified. In oh, yeah. Right, no right. But over here, it's kind of questionable. Like, was well, Samson over here? Samson fornicated with Delilah, <laughs> but he's a hero. I mean, did God overlook that? David committed adultery with Bathsheba, but we know that's called the sure mercies of David. God went out of the dispensation to show more grace on David. So they were sinners too, but they must have had this for their sin. Well, there's Saul. That's a, that's a question. Well, that's Saul is a great question. Yeah, I know. Saul was a great king until he turned, and then he goes to a witch. So you wonder if Saul's not over here. Yeah. But 
if Saul sacrificed before he died, he was. I mean, I just, we'll know when we get to heaven, you know. I, I think that the, the Jew was a particular people, right? And they were the example for the pagans. You know, mm -hmm. many things that they knew what God did for the right. nation, all the miracles, all and, the and God gave. So that was an offering for the pagans to follow the, the Jews. Sure. Not the Jews to go and start doing Amen. the things the pagans do. Right. And God gave the law to Israel. And all over the world, people saw that law. Have you ever heard of Hammurabi's code? It sounds almost like the law. So people saw that and began to realize, hey, there's some good stuff there. And so a lot of people did try to do it the way the Jews did and tried to come to God. So, yes, ma'am, one more. Uh, we went longer this week. Yes, there were sacrifices before the law many times. So people that weren't even weren't Israelites, they could have been sacrificing, you know, yeah. Following God's law, yes, law, right, and outside of Israel too. But also remember, the pagans would sacrifice to their false yeah, gods, yeah. yeah, and oftentimes they right. sacrifice human beings, right. which is ugh. Abrahamism isn't the only. I mean, Israel's aren't the only people. Abraham was a Gentile, right? There, there could be a lot of people down here that weren't Jewish, right. and before even Abraham, there was people that came down here, but they all had to follow through the blood atonement of a lamb. Or of an animal. Um, yeah, Job. And Job was as righteous as he could be. So he didn't have to do as many of these as a lot of other people. Um, but yeah, this it's fun to talk about. And we could get even deeper into how about these people? <laughs> what happens to them? Well, they're not dying and going down here. So if they die, they go, well, some of them may not die. But could you live here and then you go before the great white throne of judgment? How do you justify your life if you sinned? Would there still be sacrifices of animals here? Or does that mean this sacrifice is over? And there, there's too many questions I have. Well, yeah, in the Bible we read about in the Millennial Kingdom that the priests are sacrificing in the temple. So why are they doing that if Jesus' sacrifice was the one sacrifice forever? Maybe it was just for, for show? I don't see how I have all these questions, but they still do. I, I think it's because new people is going to be, uh, you know, being born. And, right. and so then that is like a, they're probably going to be sinning and that's why they bring the day. Right. But see, then if they sacrifice for their sins, then what does that leave the sacrifice of Jesus? Yes. Was that only for us? It's supposed to be the one sacrifice for sins forever. Yes. So are they just doing sacrifices over here? Because the priests get to eat the meat? <laughs> I don't know. But there's going to be a temple. There's, so there's so many questions. I just to show? I don't know. That's, see, there's a lot of things I still can't get a hold of. But I do know that the Bible says there will be um, sacrifices in the millennium. So what are they for? That's the question. And so there you go. <laughs> now we're all confused. No. <laughs> all right. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Well, I've enjoyed this. It's fun to get in a Bible study, but the more we study what we think we know, the more we realize we don't know all. But what we do know, we're thankful for. And we do know God wants people to get married and stay together. He doesn't like divorce. And we do know there are dispensations. So let's continue to teach that to our children and begin to tell others and uh, wait for Jesus to come back because, man, the sooner the better.